right now on the National Weather Desk. Another wallop of winter sends a fire truck spinning out of control, while flash floods inundate cars and neighborhoods in San Diego. Will this week's rain in Texas put a dent in the state's drought? And a warming in upstate New York following many ice rescues. We'll unveil the dirty truth about composting and its impact on climate change. And look at the factors that help create a snowflake's shape. From our nation's capital, this is the National Weather Desk. Good morning and welcome to the National Weather Desk. I'm meteorologist Eileen Whalen. Well, many people in the Midwest are waking up to ice this morning as another system makes its way east. Now, you may have seen this video on your social pages. It's wild, showing a fire truck spinning out of control near St. Louis. And it was just one of many places where ice-coated roads uh, made travel very dangerous. Uh, in central Missouri, rain was freezing as it made contact with cars and roads. While in Oklahoma City, this tractor trailer struggled to get on an off-ramp but slid backwards. Mike McCarthy is in central Ohio where ice is starting to form this morning. To highlight how the conditions can change in just a step or two, we have found this spot right here along the road, right where these bricks are at. If you look right here, we've got a puddle. Just wet right here, obviously, but you take just one or two steps down and we have some ice forming on these bricks. To show you that, we brought a hammer with us this morning. I gotta be gentle, I don't need a bill from the city of Marysville for damaged bricks, but it doesn't take a lot of effort to break up the ice that is here. Just a few taps and you'll start to see the ice on these bricks break up. If you have a front stoop or a driveway that has not been treated at all, this is what is likely gonna greet you on your step out the door. You can see that thin layer of ice that is starting to develop right here along the road and even on the parking spots here along uh, Main Street as well in the city of Marysville. Well, we now wanna take a closer look at that remarkable video of a fire truck spinning out of control on an icy street. Caitlin Voise is just south of St. Louis with more on what happened there. <laughs> Homeowners in this imperial neighborhood woke up to a loud boom on Monday morning as a rock community fire truck lost control on their icy street, slamming into a car and just missing a nearby home. Caitlin Voicey recorded the now viral video. She called 911 after an accident moments before, prompting the fire department's response. But as the fire truck was approaching, Voicey says she had a bad feeling given the icy conditions. The fireman said that he tried to aim for the grass and the tree to stop it, um, but the back wheels just slid around him and he came uh, burling this way. I saw the fire truck just come flying down the road right here. He started recording, capturing the fire truck hitting the blue car in Voicey's side yard and coming to a rest just inches from the neighbor's home. The fire truck was coming down so fast. I don't know if it was because they just lost control completely and they were flying down, but they started to circle and spiral right here. Um, and right after they had done that, they hit that blue car. And I think that hitting that blue car really preventing them from hitting the house. The Rock Community Fire Protection District says all four firefighters on board were not hurt and credits the driver for preventing a more severe crash. Well, there was dramatic flash flooding in San Diego where the city had its wettest January day ever. Scenes like this prompted the mayor to declare a state of emergency. Now, keep your eye on the white car in the middle of the screen. The power of the water lifted it up and swept it away. In other parts of the city, water completely covered cars. People stood on the roofs of their homes, waiting for first responders to rescue them. Some were brought to safety on kayaks. And this woman describes how high the water came into her home. The highest part of our house was our kitchen island. And that's where we were sitting on top of until we were able to get out safely. Well, the water was also too high for family pets, so rescue crews carried them to dry land. Now, it was the fifth rainiest day in San Diego's recorded history. Flood watches are posted across portions of the south today. The greatest risk for severe storms is along the Texas Gulf Coast, but the threat extends into several neighboring states. Overall, it's going to be a very wet week with some places expecting more than six inches of rain. Central Texas got a heavy dose of rain yesterday. The water filled area creeks and streams, causing some to overflow. 
Now, while flooding is a short term concern, many are wondering if the rain is going to be enough to quench the state's long drought. Melanie Torre is in Austin with more. This rainfall has been good. It's been heavy. Unfortunately, it hasn't been in the right place. Kelly Payne with the LCRA says the rain missed the mark to help refill our reservoirs by about 100 miles. But hope isn't lost. We do have more rain in the forecast, so this wasn't the one-shot deal. Uh, we've got a couple more um, bands of rain that'll come through. Maybe they'll hit a little bit farther upstream and give us some beneficial inflows. We do see some promising signs, so a lot of the rain fell within the Edwards Aquifer recharge zone, and we're seeing a lot of the creeks and streams that recharge the aquifer, we're seeing an increase in flow in those, in those creeks. Jeffrey Watson at the Barton Springs Edwards Aquifer Conservation District says they're optimistic this rainfall will cause an increase in aquifer levels and spring flow at Barton Springs. Still, we're deep in a drought that isn't going anywhere just yet. Texas is a very sort of boomer bust um, climate and it's important that when we're in the bust part of this the um, cycle that we're conserving as much as we can. Well, there's been a disturbing increase in the number of ice rescues in central New York, and this has fire departments warning people to stay off the ice. Mary Keelar is near Syracuse, New York, with details. A 36-year-old woman falling into the frigid waters after she ran out to try and get her dogs. Chilson says it took less than five minutes to rescue the woman and get her into an ambulance, but they couldn't save the dogs. This rescue, one of several recently. Last week, two men were brought to safety in Oneida County after a dog fell through the ice. Earlier this month, a man died after trying to ice fish near Cooperstown. And an Onondaga County man died after his truck fell through the icy St. Lawrence River Bay. Each call presenting challenges that first responders try to train for. But Chief Chilson says it's on everyone to think before they decide to chance it on the ice. To stay off the ice, especially in a place like the Seneca River that's moving water. Uh, we haven't had real cold temperatures, you know, so it doesn't really freeze thick enough all the way across for somebody to go out there. Another rescue in Vermont, where 21 skiers and snowboarders became lost while skiing in the backcountry. The Killington search and rescue team hiked, snowshoed, and skinned five miles to help bring the group to safety. A short time later, another call came for two more lost skiers. They were led out of the woods by 7.30 Saturday night. Well, this past weekend marked 25 years since the worst tornado outbreak in Arkansas history. 56 twisters touched down from January 21st to the 22nd in 1999. Eight people lost their lives and more than 140 were injured. Meteorologist James Bryant and Ashley Lunningham look back on a day that many in Arkansas will never forget. Between the 21st and 22nd, a total of 56 tornadoes touched down in the state making it the largest tornado outbreak in Arkansas history. Eight of those tornadoes were rated at least F3, and there was an F4 in Clay County. 30 of the tornado tracks were across 15 counties, responsible for eight deaths and over 100 injuries. Tornado after tornado formed, leaving a path of destruction from Hot Springs to Jonesboro. In Little Rock, customers and employees were trapped inside the Harvest Food Store. Many trapped in homes that had been leveled. Got at least 45 minutes. Because I looked at my watch at 7.15 and it felt like we'd been down there forever. So it had to be at least 45 minutes, maybe longer. Did everything come down on top of you? Did yes. you feel the house move? Oh, we, the house totally shifted over and it fell all down on us. I don't see how we lived through it, so I don't know. The man upstairs just had to be looking after us. When you look at some of the destruction, you think of a few inches here, a few feet there, and we'd have a lot more fatalities than we we're even reporting. It just looks like a massive set of bombs have exploded. There's not a, there's not hardly a residence standing. Old trees that would be somewhere well over 75 to 100 years old have been tossed and twisted, metal, debris. It's just unbelievable. And check this out. Funnel clouds were spotted in California's San Joaquin Valley on Monday, especially near Fresno. The National Weather Service says these aren't tornadoes and they're fairly harmless. They typically form in the areas behind a storm system where it's not raining that much. And coming up on the National Weather Desk, we'll look at why maritime forests are so important to coastal communities.
You are watching the National Weather Desk. Maritime forests grow along both the Atlantic and Pacific coast as well as barrier islands. And one of their key functions is to protect coastal communities from severe weather like hurricanes and storm surge. But as Lauren Lennon reports, many of these forests are now shrinking at an alarming rate. The trees in here are protecting us, so we need to protect them. Protecting what keeps us safe. So in addition to being a home to a wide diversity of, of wildlife, um, is an incredibly protective and critical part of our island's resiliency and hurricane storm surge protection plan. Um, the trees and the vegetation in the maritime forest provide a vegetative wall, if you will, between the ocean and the homeowners, so that as storm surge comes in from the ocean, they provide that wall to protect us from, from, from that water. And so it's critically important that we preserve these trees to protect the island from that kind of destructive erosion. But Baiko says there are some threats to this forest, one being the illegal cutting of the trees. People um, frequently who come out here and cut into in this public land trust um, trees and vegetation um, that they do not own and they don't have a right to do. So there's this constant threat from illegal cutting from people going out and cutting in this protected land. This land is protected for all of us to be able to enjoy. Baiko says everyone should care about this issue and continue to advocate for the protection of these 195 acres. We live in a world where we know that there is um, the, the effects of climate change are accelerating, right? So we know that these types of habitats are increasingly being destroyed and eroded. I just encourage everybody to come out here and know why we are fighting so hard to try to save this. Up the coast in Rhode Island, storms eroded dunes and nearly nine feet of the beachfront. Meteorologist Christina Ernie recently posted about the disappearing dunes on TikTok. Rhode Island's coastline battered by recent storms. This most recent one bringing storm surge and dangerous seas. And it pushed back dunes on Narragansett Town Beach more than eight or nine feet. Fences used to protect the sensitive dunes crumpled. And as we see during these erosion events, things being uncovered in the sand like steel pipes, wires, even old chunks of roadways. As these types of events continue to push back the beach, the future of homes and businesses on the shore come into question as nature literally eats away at them. One beach house unfortunately came out on the losing side with the storm exposing the foundation, massive damage to this structure. And it's hard to believe that waves actually reached the top of this protective wall trying to help to protect damage to this house. Other coastal properties are seeing salt water eat away at their structures faster than ever before. Whether it's the high winds, the storm surge, or the more frequent events we now see. You can see how much sand was washed out from these steps, about three feet missing in this particular area. Beachfront businesses now have to worry about their future here. This storm surge, though, not great for beachgoers either, where the storm surge has even uncovered where the previous pier and beachfront properties used to be decades ago. You've no doubt heard no two snowflakes are alike, so how do they form and what determines their shape? Meteorologist Anthony McCarry has today's lessons on snowflakes. So as we know, of course, on a cold winter's day, if you're going to get snow, usually near 32 degrees at the surface, sometimes you could cheat and it could be a little bit warmer. But in the upper parts of the atmosphere, of course, it's usually colder, sometimes much colder. Thin plates. This forms temperatures 25 to 32 degrees. Needles getting a little colder, 21 to 25. Columns, 14 to 21 degrees. We're still not done yet, getting colder. Stellar plates now taking on a shape you might be a little more accustomed to, 10 to 14. But dendrites, this is the one you probably know the most in terms of what a snowflake looks like. So now you know there's many other different types. You get dendrites form when the atmosphere's temperature three to 10 degrees, so relatively cold. Now within all of these categories, like you mentioned, no two snowflakes are alike. That's because every snowflake, as it moves through the atmosphere, it can collide with other snowflakes. The atmosphere itself can contain dirt and other particles, and they bump into each other, growing hexagon by hexagon. And even the start of the process, the initial ice nuclei, positive and negative charges, create that shape. So really, even though there's so many millions of snowflakes that fall in one storm, each one is just a little bit different. So we know snowflake types, but what type of snow is best for building a snowman? Meteorologist Lindsay Stores posted on Instagram how you can tell if the snow in your yard will work for building the flawless Frosty. 
If you want to build a snowman this winter season, the snow has to be just right. If your snow is too dry, it'll be fluffy and won't pack well. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if your snow is very wet or slushy, it also won't be very good for packing. You need your snow to have a water content right in the middle of the spectrum to have it packed just right to make the perfect snowman. If you compact the snow into a firm snowball, it's good snow for making a snowman. If you can't, if it's too fluffy like this, unfortunately, you've got to wait for a wetter snow. Many states and cities are adopting new composting programs. The goal is to reduce food waste in landfills. A compost expert told our Emily Gracie that throwing food in a landfill is a big contributor to climate change. Composting is an aerobic process, meaning you have oxygen in there, where if you go to a landfill, it gets covered up and sealed in and, and it goes through a fermentation process, meaning no oxygen, so it goes anaerobic. And so when you have aerobic with oxygen or without, those are very different bio biochemical pathways. And the end result of composting is carbon dioxide. The end result of um, anaerobic or fermentation in a landfill would be methane. But both greenhouse gases, so. Yes. So tell me why we wanna compost and not trash it. When it's anaerobic, it decomposes very, very slowly. So you put it in a landfill, it's probably not gonna decompose much. If you're composting it, um, it's going to decompose. And the thing is, is methane is much more powerful in terms of its impact. Do different foods emit different amounts of these gases? Like say, if you're, if you're prioritizing what you compost, is there something that's really potent that we should really prioritize getting in the compost bin? The ones that contribute the most to like greenhouse gases, like the nitrous oxides, and so forth are actually high protein foods like red meats and dairy products and some seafood. Can you break it down and let me know what you can compost and what you can't compost? You know, most people know fruits and vegetables, right? Or they think backyard leaves and so I always forth. think eggshells. That's like eggshells, <laughs> coffee grounds. Probably some of the ones that people might not think of is you can actually compost um, deceased animals or wildlife or your pets. They would break down, but it takes special attention when you're doing that, because as you can imagine, one is people don't always feel that comfortable with it emotionally, but you know, and you want to bury it pretty deep. So you're not going to attract wildlife. To hear more from Deb on composting, check out this week's episode of our podcast, Off the Radar. It has all the dirty details, whether you're just compost curious or interested in planting a green burial, Find Off the Radar anywhere you listen to podcasts. You are watching the National Weather Desk. Things this week will be unseasonably warm for many parts of the country, and you might notice that the days are also getting a little bit longer. But just how much longer? Here's meteorologist Allison Gutlieber. We are finally gaining daylight. Now we've been gaining daylight since December of 2023. That's when the winter solstice happened. The winter solstice is when the northern hemisphere is tilted farthest away from the sun and we have the shortest day and the longest night. Now in December, we were only gaining about a few seconds to a few minutes, but now in January, we're gaining a lot more. So let's talk about January. It's the first full month we're gaining daylight down in the southern portions of the United States in Texas and even over in Florida, they're seeing about 20 or so minutes gained, even a little bit more. Then we get into this yellow zone. So that's where we're seeing 30 minutes for gained daylight. And then between the central portions of the United States, between 30 and 40 minutes are gained. If you keep going up north, that's where you're going to see the most. So between 50 minutes, getting close to an hour, and then even an hour or more at the most northern places of the United States. We'd love to share your weather content on the air. You can find us on all of your favorite social media platforms. Just search the National Weather Desk.